Chat TV viewers and SMC social media viewers. I'm your host, Tina Cabral. Today, we'll be talking about quarantine and how mindfulness and comedy can help to reduce stress, anxiety, and depression during isolation. We are all adapting to a new way of life, and it can be crazy at times, and we are all adapting to it in different ways. For some, it's been quite difficult, almost unbearable. If we as a society don't take the proper protocols to sustain our mental well-being, then we'll simply have another crisis on our hands. Joining me to today to talk about this important conversation is my dearest friend, Dr. Alicia Ruglis, who is a clinical psychologist licensed in the states of New York and New Jersey. Thank you for joining me today, Alicia. Thank you for having me, uh, Tina. Um, I just wanted to share a little bit more about my background and experience. So as you mentioned, I'm a clinical psychologist licensed in the states of New York and New Jersey. I've been practicing in the field of psychology for over 20 years now. And my clinical areas of expertise include the assessment and treatment of stress, trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder, and substance use disorder. Um, and so I am very happy to be here to talk more about the impact of COVID-19 on our mental well-being. Now, I know we've had a discussion on mindfulness pre-COVID. And since then, studies have shown that there's been an increase in stress, depression, and anxiety. Now, can you give me any uh, your thoughts on these conditions and how to reduce them? Well, Tina, we are in an unprecedented time as a country in the world uh, where we're all exposed to and we continue to experience what we're calling the mass trauma of COVID-19. And we call it mass trauma because we're all experiencing it together. And understandably, there's been a rise in the levels of stress, anxiety, depression, sadness that people are experiencing in response to COVID-19. It's a very stressful and traumatic situation. And so a lot of the stress and the anxiety may be related to will I get COVID or not? Um, losing a job, disruptions in their work life, school life. Uh, some people are finding that being home with their spouses, with their parents, with their roommates all day, every day, it's now bringing up a lot of challenges. Um, there are definitely a lot of worries about what the future will look like. What will life look like for us after the social distancing ends? When will the, the social distancing end? Will we be able to go back to the way things were or will things be radically different? And what will that radically different look like? We're still trying to make sense of that. Absolutely. And yeah, it's, it's hard because you really don't know what the future is with all these uncertainties. Yeah. Life is really in the now and that's a huge loss for everybody. And I know that yeah. with mindfulness, um, it's important to stay groundful, grounded, right. which is one key aspect. And being very intentional, humble, and even dismal, yet not sad to help not lose sight of this reality, yeah. Yeah. while also finding the balance to yeah. tend to oneself or self-care. True. And I know escapism, such as listening to music. I know I listened to a lot of music from when I was growing up, nostalgic music, yeah. movies to bring you back to sort of a more comforting time um, can be yeah. very helpful. But it's key sure. to find the balance between staying it, grounded in this tragic reality we're in and also engaging yeah. in healthy forms of escapism. And yes, yeah. Uh, being a comedian, laughter is definitely mm -hmm. the, the best medicine and helps boost the, mu the immune system, wouldn't you say? Yes, I, I would definitely say that. Um, this theme of balancing, uh, sort of fully being present in the moment with 
also finding ways to distract from uh, painful uh, experiences. Um, you call it escapism. You know, I, I might call it adaptive coping, that there's sometimes when we need to shift our attention away from all the pain that we're hearing about in the media. Uh, there's a lot of loss and a lot of grief uh, emerging. Um, you know, we're mourning the loss of the way things were, our sense of normalcy. We're hearing about a lot of deaths on a daily basis. Um, we see that racial ethnic minorities are dying at a higher rates um, from COVID-19, and that's painful to see. We're learning about these deaths through the media, and that's vicarious trauma for a lot of us. Uh, we're hearing about a lot of people losing their jobs. The unemployment rate is about 25% now as of this week. People have lost their financial security, and it's we don't know when people are going to be able to regain that. Um, so there's a lot of loss. There's a lot of grieving about um, what we've lost uh, so far. But there's also a lot of grieving about what could have been our future dreams that may have to be put on hold. So lots of students were expecting to walk in graduations uh, in May and June, and that's not going to happen the way that they imagined it to be. Uh, maybe people were going to start a new job. Um, maybe they don't have that job anymore. Lots of corporations are coming back. So yes, there's a lot of loss. There's a lot of grief. There's a lot of stress. There's a lot of anxiety. Um, we're hearing about a lot of painful experiences. So how do we um, how do we fully take that in and not have it overwhelm us? How do we cope with it in effective ways? And how do we just sort of acknowledge that, okay, it's a painful time and it's okay that we're feeling anxious or stressed or feeling loss and grief because some difficult things have happened uh, recently related to COVID-19. Now, Alicia, how do you know when you're experiencing anxiety? Uh, so anxiety, emotionally, you feel nervous. Uh, for some people, they have physical symptoms, so shortness of breath, heart palpitations, muscle tensions. You may find that you're having difficulty sleeping. A lot of people who are anxious, they may have anxious thoughts. Something bad is going to happen. I'm going to get COVID-19 if I leave the house. Um, you know, people may avoid things that they're afraid of because they're afraid something bad is going to happen. So there is good avoidance, right? We know we need to physically distance and um, stay away, you know, stay far away from people. But there's the extreme of that where some people may think, okay, I can never leave my house again, or, you know, I'm going to get COVID-19. And that's extreme and can contribute to more stress and anxiety because you, go, you don't get to discover that you can go out there in the world you can take precautions, um, and that you can come back home and be okay. Right. And so I know with comedy, we tend to channel or redirect our nervous energy. Where yeah. Sometimes it's not so intuitive, but we actually are taught that before we go on stage. And yeah. that can turn to be sort of, you could develop a uniqueness or a niche as a result yeah. of that. So I remember when I first mm -hmm. went on stage, about four years ago, I was so incredibly nervous. I, I didn't know. Right, understandably. I literally thought I was going to faint or vomit or both. And right. luckily I didn't. Right. So I subsequently joked about that at a later performance and the audience just got a kick out of that. You know, right. so it's kind of like owning my nervousness and redirecting. Sure. And, yeah. uh, and I think that was a pretty safe way of, of dealing with my yeah. nervousness. But Lisa, yeah. what, how would you know whether these feelings are normal or not? And when do they become a psychological disorder? Right. I really like that example, uh, Tina, of feeling nervous before a performance because that's normal. Uh, and actually some anxiety is normal, it's adaptive. Um, you know, it actually improved your performance once you were able to, <laughs> to name it um, and, you know, it enhanced your performance. Uh, so some anxiety is normal in terms of performance, doing well in a job interview, 
And a lot of what we're feeling now in terms of the anxiety related to COVID-19, that's normal as well because it's an abnormal situation. Um, now, when does it cross the line into becoming a disorder is when you're feeling that anxiety very intensely, it's debilitating, you're not able to function in your day-to-day -day life, um, you know, difficulty getting to work or taking care of things at home or even in your relationships. Um, when it becomes so emotionally distressing and debilitating, then it's possible that you crossed over into developing an anxiety disorder. And so you may want to seek a consultation with a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Um, in any event, what we want to be thinking about is how people are coping um, and working on helping them to build resilience. So you found a way to cope in that moment by, okay, giving voice to it. It became a part of your routine um, and people liked you for that. So some coping strategies are more adapted than others and people have different ways that they like to cope. So for example, you know, um, turning to family members and friends for support, uh, exercising, um, reading, listening to music, uh, watching movies. Um, these would all be considered uh, adaptive coping. Uh, on the flip side of that, um, you know, people may turn to alcohol or drugs as a way to cope. Um, we do know that there are concerns about whether uh, drinking will go up. Uh, the liquor stores were deemed essential services, and we've heard that sales of alcohol um, have gone up. Um, and so there's some concern, is that going to contribute to problems? Um, now, I don't think drinking necessarily has to become a problem if you're keeping your drinking levels at the recommended uh, daily drinking levels. So the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, I'll share a link uh, in the notes, uh, recommends that women uh, do not drink more than one drink per day and no more than seven drinks per week. And for men, no more than two drinks per day and no more than 14 drinks per week. So if you're keeping your drinking at or below those levels, then theoretically you shouldn't develop a problem. But if you're drinking well above that and you're drinking heavily and it's causing problems, again, you're not waking up uh, on time for your job, you're neglecting your children, you're neglecting your work, then you may have to consider, reflect on, okay, what is this excessive drinking about? What's underlying the drinking? Um, and is there a more adaptive way that I could cope with the stress uh, that I'm feeling? Um, so I think that's going to be uh, critical to consider as, as we um, keep moving along in this COVID-19 era, that for people uh, who turn to drinking. It's the short-term gain, long-term pain idea that in the short run, it may feel like, okay, it's helping me to cope with stress. But in the long run, if you're drinking heavily, um, you may end up developing problems, sleep problems, anxiety, depression, health problems. And so you want to just pay close attention to how you're coping and make sure that it's on the more adaptive side of coping. Right. So <clears throat> what you're saying, Lisi, is that we don't have to go through this trauma alone. Um, as social creatures, we need to develop connections with one another um, yeah. or one ourselves if we go inward or a higher power or all or some of the above um, in yeah. order to get through this crisis. Um, yeah. And no matter what um, coping mechanism you have, um, whether it's healthy or not, we all have vulnerabilities and we can all succumb to them. But the point is to right. own it and get past it. Right, definitely. Um, adaptive coping, building resilience, um, and you don't have to go it alone. I think it's critical to remember that um, social support, building community, having dialogue, that this is going to be a helpful um, strategy as we keep moving forward right and as we, as you keep we keep hearing is we're in this together we're really in this together no one ha should have yeah. to go through this yeah. disaster alone yeah and yeah. Um, so there are a lot of concerns um, <clears throat> of people who have ptsd in response to covid19 
Can you tell us, Licia, what is PTSD and how can one min minimize the risk of developing it? Right. So PTSD stands for post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and like you said, there are a lot of concerns that we're going to be facing a mental health crisis uh, after COVID-19 uh, eases up, that a lot of people are going to be suffering from psychological trauma. But we know from the research that there's not a one-to-one -one link between experiencing a trauma and developing PTSD. Uh, there are lots of risk and protective factors that determine whether someone will develop PTSD after they've been exposed to a trauma. So for example, how severe was the trauma? Was someone killed or injured? Were you on the front lines or did you hear about it from someone else? We know that for a lot of the doctors and providers that are working directly with patients with COVID-19 in the hospitals, that they're witnessing the devastating effects of COVID-19. Uh, they're witnessing a lot of people dying. Uh, they're feeling the sense of helplessness because they're not able to cure uh, the people that end up going on to die. So that can contribute to more intense and more severe post-trauma reactions. Um, we know watching the repetitive uh, news media can be vicariously traumatizing. You know, every day we're hearing about 319 people have died today, especially in New York and New Jersey. That can be uh, devastating and upsetting uh, to hear about that as well. But we know the research tells us that social support is a significant protective factors. So we have to come together as a community, come together as a family, get together with your friends and talk about what you're witnessing and what you're experiencing. Talk about your thoughts and feelings about what you're going through, that that can be therapeutic and that can be protective uh, against developing PTSD. We know that with time and support, the majority of people will recover from a traumatic event. Only about seven to 10% of people who've been exposed to a trauma will develop PTSD. It's still a significant number. We do wanna prevent people from developing PTSD, um, but the majority of people will go on and um, recover. And there's actually a term in the trauma field that's called post-traumatic growth. And that's when you come out of a trauma experience um, feeling like you've grown from the experience. So that phrase, whatever doesn't kill you, uh, makes you stronger. Um, you know, that that's uh, important to think about. What will we learn? How will, we'll, how will we grow from having gone through uh, COVID-19? Will there be a greater sense of meaning in life for a lot of us having come through, come out of this experience? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, those are some great um, tips, Licia, and I absolutely agree with um, coming out of this on the positive end as much as possible, not just to Thank limit um, the statistics of those um, who experience PTSD, but just to have a different a balanced and positive state of mind. Uh, more than ever. I know for me, I've always considered myself to be a, a pretty uh, positive, grateful type of person. Right. But boy, coming out of this, I <clears throat> tell myself yeah. I will not complain about anything. I, have, <laughs> I feel more blessed now than I have yeah. ever felt yeah. before. And I know right. there's a, psycholo uh, <clears throat> a psychological term in that if you uh, daily, if you are able to recognize five blessings that you have in your life. Um, there's a rewiring in your brain that will <laughs> that will definitely sustain your your mental well being. Yeah, I think you're talking about positive psychology. This idea of gratitude, you know, that on a daily basis, if you're able to highlight, you know, what are five things that I'm grateful for. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, that being mindful of that, using gratitude, uh, that that can be helpful to help reduce that feeling, the feeling of stress and anxiety that, you know, look, I, I'm, I'm lucky, I have to count my blessings. There's so many things I can be grateful for. First of which is, you know, we're healthy and we're alive and we have a roof over our shoulders. For a lot of people, you know, the opportunity to work from home uh, is a blessing uh, in itself. Unfortunately, not a lot of people have that 
opportunity and, and that's something we need to work on as a society. Um, but I think, um, you know, even, um, right, uh, noting the ways in which um, we're lucky and we have many things to be grateful for, I think that can be critical as well. Now, I know that we're in a time where a lot of the parents and children are homebound together, parents having to be yeah. educators, um, finding themselves having, having to be educators all of a sudden, aside from child rearers. How do we keep kids um, from absorbing anxiety and parents at the same time so that they can both function, both, um, you know, be able to be productive? That's an excellent question, uh, Tina. And the American Psychological Association actually came up with a tip sheet for parents, which I will share. Uh, six tips for how to manage your children's uh, anxiety during COVID-19. Um, I think we're hearing a lot on social media. How do I work a full-time job and also homeschool my children? How do I manage my own anxiety in addition to managing my children's anxiety? And so the American Psychological Association in their tip sheet, they recommend number one, uh, trying to remain calm and reassuring uh, for your children. Um, because children tend to pick up on the emotions that you're experiencing. Children tend to model the behaviors that they're seeing in their parents. So being aware of how your behaviors, how your emotions uh, may influence your children, I think is critical. So trying to remain calm, trying to remain reassuring is a uh, number one tip. Uh, number two, uh, being open and honest with your children in an age appropriate way about what is going on. So really listening to them, taking the time to hear about their concerns and answering their questions um, in an age appropriate way. Keeping a routine, now this is a recommendation for parents and children, but you can see how it could apply to adults as well, that research shows that children benefit from schedules and productive activities. So planning out your children's day, you know, having a structure for them can be very helpful. You know, getting up at the same time, mapping out how they'll spend the day, whether it's, you know, when they'll do their homeschooling activities, when they'll do some play or creative activities, when they'll do their homework, uh, and spending time to be uh, physical together. I think um, keeping that routine on a day-to-day -day basis uh, is gonna be critical. And then of course, screen time. You know, on the one hand, you wanna limit uh, children's exposure to negative media. Um, and on the other hand, um, the tip sheet says, well, some extra screen time for things that are age appropriate, um, you know, is not so bad. You know, maybe they can spend some extra time on that screen that you can be flexible. And as parents, of course, monitoring what your children uh, are looking at on the screen uh, is critical. And then also practicing self-care. That's a theme uh, from today's show, uh, practicing self-care, taking care of yourself, staying connected, with uh, your social support system is gonna be critical because it's not easy as parents going through this uh, with children. Um, and also just to recognize your children are going through stress as well. So they may exhibit uh, mood swings, problems with attention or concentration, or may display uh, behavioral problems. And so it's important to be uh, extra patient with your child during this time to provide them with support. And if you notice that their emotions and behaviors are becoming so overwhelming or disruptive, you may want to consider seeking a consultation from a mental health uh, professional. Um, so I'm going to post the link uh, to this tip sheet uh, from uh, the American Psychological Association. But I think, um, you know, uh, my hat's off to all the parents uh, uh, during uh, this time because it's, it's not easy um, having to care for yourself along with uh, your children who are also going through the same thing. Certainly, Alicia. And I just wanted to add, seeing that, um, mentioning that creativity is the, uh, the hot commodity nowadays, is keeping um, the kids creative, productive, while they're at home and doing interactive stuff with them, such as, yeah. you know, working in community media, make your own media instead of, um, 
just sitting there and exposing yourself to hours of mindless television. Yeah, uh, nice and work. you've seen these videos for the um, healthcare workers, essential workers, where uh, neighbors, um, community people are just clapping their hands, banging on pots, uh, ringing bells, whatever they can do yeah. to show their appreciation. <laughs> these, are, these are fun things that kids could do at home, banging on a pot or clapping, make videos, um, virtual videos with their friends to also stay connected with their friends. Uh, these are all great things that, that kids can do to stay creative. I, I completely agree, Tina, and it's very heartwarming uh, to hear about uh, what they're doing out there um, and, and the, the banging on the pots and the bottles. I know and I've heard in New York City that at seven o'clock every evening, people are banging their pots and pans, their bottles uh, to say thank you uh, to the frontline workers who are, are dealing uh, with this devastating uh, COVID-19 situation. So to have children involved in that uh, can give them a sense of purpose that they're doing something to help uh, with the situation. So I love, I love that idea. Now, what, um, what if you find yourself in isolation um, the person you're with? What if you find yourself anxious or stressed because you're discovering things you really might not like about the person? <laughs> well, that, that, that's such a great question, Tina. Um, and the first thing I have to say is, you know, I'm not surprised. Uh, it's to be expected that now that you're spending 100% of your time with your husband, your wife, your roommate, your family members, that inevitably conflicts will arise because people have different preferences, different likes and dislikes. So that's going to contribute to to conflicts uh, and anxiety and stress. Um, there's a really funny joke by Steve Martin on Twitter. He said, the odds that a person is standing in the exact same spot you want to go to in the kitchen is now 80%. <laughs> and I just laugh at that because it's so true. <laughs> so the first thing you know, I recommend is to just radically accept that, okay, I'm spending more time with these people, with this person, and you know, it makes sense that there's gonna be some conflict. Um, the second thing is to think about, well, what do you want or need uh, from this person, that person, that, you know, they're not mind readers, they don't know what you're thinking or feeling, or that you're upset that they've done something. So communication is going to be key to be able to articulate, okay, this is what I think about this, this is how I feel about this, and to ask for what you want or what you need. Um, now, you can ask for what you want or need, and the person may or may not be able to give you what you want. Um, so there's also that piece of it as well. The only person that we can change is ourself, so we can control how we communicate. Um, but we may not get what we want. So in that case, you know, being willing to negotiate, being willing to compromise. I know for a lot of people, the conflicts may be around keeping the apartment clean, you know, dishes in the sink, <laughs> cleaning the bathroom, you know, the mundane things of life. But, you know, whereas one person may not mind a sink full of dishes, another people may get really stressed and anxious that the sink is full. Um, and so I think it's important to just have a dialogue, to communicate, and to be willing to compromise. If your roommate doesn't like to do the dishes, maybe you'll do the dishes and they'll do something else like clean the bathroom. Uh, if ultimately your roommate is just not willing to compromise, not willing to budge, and continues to cause stress for you, then you may want to reconsider when COVID-19 eases up, is this the person I want to keep uh, living with? You, you know, you'll have options and choices, hopefully, uh, as COVID-19 eases up and the lease will run out at some point. So you can decide to live with someone else. Um, but the first step I would say is radically accept there'll be some tensions and then communicate what you need. Ask for what you want uh, in a way that will help you to get what you want. These are great, these are great, uh, this is great information, Licia. So, and, and just to add to what you said, I think it's also very important, and as a psychologist, you can attest to this, is to be mindful or to distinguish between a person's set of behavior patterns 
and the person yeah. themselves. So you're dealing with right, two separate sure. entities, often the case. Yeah. I know with Definitely. me being a comedian, there's Tina Cabral, there's the person, and then there's the character. That's a separate right. entity. She has her own set of idiosyncrasies. Right. I know when to draw her in when, when it's necessary, yeah. and then when to leave her in her in her lane when it's necessary. So I yeah. think it's important when people yeah. to know those, dis yeah. those distinctions so that there's no anger and resentment yeah. to take it personal yeah. because that will yeah. make situation worse than it already is. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. So instead of telling your roommate they're a slob, <laughs> you know, which is sort of characterizing the whole person, you would want to just describe their behaviors. <laughs> you know, you keep leaving your dishes in the sink, you know, that's describing a behavior versus making this global statement about who that person is, which would just create more anxiety, more tension. So I agree with you of making that distinction. These are behaviors that the person is engaging in, and you can ask them to work on changing their behaviors. Now, I think, Lisa, we've done a great job of giving examples and explaining what right. mental illness is, but can you yeah. describe exactly what that is? Okay, so mindfulness is learning how to be fully present uh, in the here and now, in the moment that we're in and learning how to observe and describe your experiencing experiences, your thoughts, your feelings in a non-judgmental way. So most of the time, I think a lot of us, um, a lot of people are living in the past. Why did this thing happen to me? Why was I slighted? I didn't get that gig. Um, I, this thing didn't happen for me. So there's a lot of rumination about the past. Um, so that's living in the past. Um, and a lot of people are anxiously worried about the future. Um, of course, as I said earlier, it makes sense that we're anxious and worried given COVID-19. Um, but sometimes, you know, it's important to not live in the future too much either because it takes you away from the here and now. Um, so, you know, again, the here and now can be particularly painful for a lot of people. So we want to find ways to cope with it instead of avoiding it. Um, and so being able to stay in the moment, to be able to stay with and name those painful emotions, I think is critical. Um, studies show that when we're able to name whatever emotions that we're feeling, that it allows us to step away from it, to reflect on it, and it gives us a greater sense of control. Uh, so I think mindfulness, learning how to observe what you're thinking and feeling, checking in with yourself, how am I feeling? Um, naming that emotion, which allows you to step away to reflect on it. Um, and then, you know, just accepting that emotion uh, without judging it. Um, and there are different things that people can do to cultivate a sense of mindfulness. Uh, one of the simplest ways is just to focus on your breath to do some deep breathing. You know, when you're feeling particularly stressed out to just stop, take a few deep breaths and just check in with yourself. You know, how am I feeling in this moment right now? Naming that feeling um, and not judging uh, your experience. Um, that that's gonna be a, a critical component for everyone in terms of their recovery. Trying to stay grounded, trying to stay present, getting in touch with your feelings, naming them, without judging them. That's great. I, and I totally agree with the, with the breathing techniques. Um, when I go on stage, some performers may take a shot of something or whatever. Right. I do the very deep breathing. It's almost, it's very palatable when I do the deep breathing, but it definitely calms my nerves and it right. re-energizes, really re-energizes. Oh me. yeah, definitely. So it's a great technique to have and really definitely. get in tune with yourself. Exactly. I agree. And so we also mentioned, Licia, that in mindfulness, the human connection is a very, very important yeah. aspect. Yeah. And we sure. still apply that to, to quarantine. Definitely. A social human connections are key. Um, I know for a lot of people, uh, the need to physically distance from others um, has led to an increase in their sense of social isolation and loneliness. Um, 
for a lot of other people, they've used this time to kind of reflect on who they are and their relationships. And, you know, they've, they've found themselves reaching out to people that they haven't spoken to uh, in a while. Um, and I like the distinction that people are making in the social media sphere. There's a difference between physical distancing versus social distancing. That yes, physically we're apart, but it doesn't mean that we have to be socially distant from uh, one another. And so you have to think about, okay, how do I want to maintain connections throughout this COVID-19 era? We know a lot of people are doing things on Zoom, Zoom videos, uh, Zoom virtual happy hours, um, et cetera, video chats, uh, text messages, good old phone calls. I know a lot of people are feeling the Zoom fatigue. Um, you know, when you've been on a million Zoom meetings uh, throughout the week for work, it might feel hard to then get on a Zoom meeting, uh, you know, to spend time with friends. Um, but, you know, so good old fashioned phone calls can be helpful as well, because I think, you know, as we've been talking about the human connection uh, is gonna be critical throughout this uh, recovery process. Um, how have you been dealing with this Zoom uh, fatigue that people are talking about? Just like everybody else, I'm Zoomed out completely. Yeah. I mean, some days, some days <laughs> better than others, but you know how it is. It's a whole different world, and we all have to. I've made my peace with it. I've made my peace right. with it. Um, yeah. So, and, yeah. And that's, and I hope that that's the case for more and more people who haven't done so yet. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think for a lot of people also dealing with loneliness, there are ways to connect online. You know, I've been hearing about virtual book clubs. Um, people are still trying to date uh, in, the, in the age of COVID-19 and doing things virtually. Um, you know, um, there are lots of different um, virtual ways to socially connect. We've been hearing about the Instagram live battles, people showing up to these parties. Um, that, you know, people are finding a lot of joy in that, a way to be a part of a crowd, to be a part of something and still connect with others. So think about what works for you um, and make sure that you're checking in with someone at least daily, if not weekly. Absolutely. And um, you have also been mentioning limiting your exposure to news media. Um, and it's important to do that because um, you know, access yeah. stations, um, such as SMC, provide up-to-date COVID information. You don't need to turn on to a mainstream outlet yeah. to get that. We, yeah. we call them yeah. from, from the, uh, the experts and provide them yeah. directly to you. And um, with, with messages also from people just like yourself, community members who are dealing with the same thing that you're dealing, yeah. dealing with. So yeah. it's important to, to know where to get your information from and to limit exposure to different types of information which goes back to um, how other ways of dealing with COVID positive. Yeah. Can you talk about some of those other ways? Sure, sure. I definitely want to echo your recommendation. You know, I'm definitely trying to limit my media exposure. I check the news in the morning and at the end of the day. Um, certainly earlier in the COVID-19 uh, situation, I was checking every hour, every day. And I found that that was too <laughs> a taxing emotionally. Um, and so I've limited uh, my exposure to the media as a way to protect my mental uh, well-being. Um, so, you know, in terms of other positive uh, strategies, uh, number one, validate your anxiety and your stress. <laughs> you know, it's okay. Uh, it's it's normal to feel the way that you're, nor that you're feeling because of COVID-19. So validating. Uh, those feelings of stress and anxiety. Uh, number two, um, I love this strategy from Dr. Robert Leahy. He, he wrote a book called The Worry Cure. And he talks about, are your worries productive or unproductive? Um, and so productive worries are things that you can take action on now. Um, so worries about COVID-19, we know that there are things that we can do to protect ourselves, uh, wearing a mask, uh, washing our hands, uh, using hand sanitizer, et cetera, physically distancing. Um, so these are things that are within our control. Think about what's in your control. 
what can you take action on that's within your control? And the other things that are outside of your control, you have to work on uh, radically accepting. Uh, also, we're going to have to learn how to tolerate a bit of uncertainty. I know that's hard for a lot of people. It can be hard for myself as well. But since we don't know when COVID-19 will end, since we don't know what the new normal will be like, uh, since the information is changing day by day, there's a way in which we have to learn how to tolerate uncertainty. And as new information comes in, we will make different decisions. We will take different actions according to the messages uh, that we're hearing, the factual messages uh, that we're hearing. Um, so I think that's uh, gonna be important, learning how to tolerate uncertainty. And finally, continue to work on your life goals. Um, even though COVID-19 has kind of put the pause on certain things, in our lives, or maybe it's delayed certain things we wanted to work on. I think it's important to keep working on your life goals on a day to day basis. Think about what's one thing that I can do to move towards the goals that I have in mind, whether it's going back to graduate school or, or shifting vocations, writing a book or, or whatever it may be. Keep working on your day to day goals because it's going to help add to and give your life a sense of meaning, a sense of purpose, that there's still something that you're working towards. You don't have to throw that out. Excellent points, Alicia. And, um, you know, in talking of, of goals such as long term learning, I know um, these Ivy League universities, a couple of them, such as Yale and Harvard University, are offering free online certificates. Yeah. Courses. Uh, wow, yeah. that's amazing. Can you imagine that? Free yeah. Ivy League education. You can yes. only in <laughs> Right. People yeah. should take advantage of resources. Oh, so, yeah. Wonderful idea. Yeah. Yeah. Get a search of information up for, for our yeah. youth to see. Them. Okay. Excellent. Good. Good. Alicia, as we start to wrap up, our viewers want to know how, how are you as a healthcare professional, a person who's also in the front lines dealing with this crisis as you're helping others deal with it at the same time. Yeah, I mean, as I said earlier, it's unprecedented times, right? This is probably one of the first times, probably not, but in recent history where uh, mental health providers are going through the same trauma that their clients are going through. So there is understandably some concern that, you know, what is it going to be like on us as mental health providers as we're hearing about a lot of the, the trauma and life crises that our clients are going through. And all of the strategies that I mentioned earlier about positive coping, I try to do that myself. Um, Self-care, I try to get enough sleep, I try to eat well, I try to exercise. Um, social support, I turn to dear friends like you, Tina, you know, my sisters, um, my parents, uh, my spouse, you know, I turn to my social support system uh, as a way to get, uh, you know, to, to talk to. And then I also have a peer support group. I have a monthly uh, group of clinical psychologists. There are about five, five of us and we meet on a monthly basis and we're talking about COVID-19 and the impact on us and how to cope. Um, and then I try to find meaning, uh, a sense of meaning in the work that I'm doing, um, that my work is making a difference in people's lives, and that this time is particularly critical um, in my clients' lives. And so I'm uh, honored that I get to be there on this journey with them. And I also take a lot of strength from my clients who are persevering and are you know, uh, making it through this tough time. So I'm inspired as well by the people that I work with. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm glad that I can uh, be there to provide that support, but I'm also taking the necessary steps to make sure that I don't get burnt out or that I don't suffer from vicarious trauma as well. And doing things like this as well uh, can be helpful to me that I can come on a show like this and share my knowledge, my expertise, some tips and strategy for the Somerville community. I'm very thrilled that I was able to do that. Having grown up in Somerville, I'm glad that I can give back uh, to the city. That's great. And I know your clients are very lucky to have you. Um, thank you for coming on the thank show you. today. I'm so glad to hear that you're taking the proper steps to self-care. Thank you, Somerville. Thank you.